feeding the survivors. Now absorbed into a new government department DEFRA, the Ministry of Agriculture, Fisheries and Food, MAFF, had the prime responsibility for the feeding arrangements for the surviving population. The backbone of the provision was the strategic food stockpile through a national network of buffer depots. There were three of these depots in Leicestershire. Little Glen Road, Glen Parva, now a housing estate. New Street, Earl Shilton, now a housing estate. Station Road, Castle Donnington, now a furniture warehouse. The location of these buffer depots was a very closely guarded government secret up until the early 1990s. However, it is interesting to note a story recalled by a buffer depot inspector. He was lost trying to find the one he was to inspect and pulled over to ask a local resident. He gave the address but not what exactly he was looking for. He was shocked to find the resident state, oh, you mean, that food depot. Ian Rosie was a finance officer with MAFF and involved in the ultimate sale of the buffer depots. The depots bore no markings and there was nothing to suggest what was contained within. They held sealed packs of boiled sweets, fat, yeast, sugar, flour, yeast bread, home office soup and high energy biscuits. With respect to the biscuits I recall some dock workers trying them out and regretting finding themselves feeling over hyperactive. The stockpiles were turned over every six months under secret nighttime delivery. To emphasize this last point Earl Shilton resident Roy Bonza whose home backed onto the Earl Shilton depot told me, in all the time the depot was there we never saw a vehicle arrive or leave. However, during the summer there was always a black cloud above it as swarms of wasps would congregate no doubt attracted by the sugar. The public would be asked to stockpile enough food for themselves to last at least 14 days after the attack and thus stocks held in the buffer depots would not be released until then, radiation levels permitting. Also, within these depots were held stocks of feeding equipment. Approximate total figures for all three depots were Sire boilers 1850 Field cookers 650 Camp kettles 3250 Baking trays 2300 Plastic bowls half pint 111250 Spoons 116450 Rectangular containers 2,500 Cylindrical containers 19,000 Also stocked with tarpaulins and poles, soup ladles, stirring spoons and kerosene lamps. To supplement MAFF food stocks, county and district councils had their own food stockpiling arrangements. These were usually in the form of active food shops, storage and distribution companies. Under emergency powers in a build-up to war these premises would be requisitioned by the local district authority under the direction of the county food officer with the aid of the police. These were namely Blobby Asda Superstore, Foss Park, Charnwood Walkers Crisps, Thermiston, Harbour BOCM, Lutterworth, Golden Wonder Crisps, Cattle Market, Hinkley and Bosworth SPD, Hinkley. Leicester Markets, British Bakeries, Co-op Scoobamore Road, Wigston Cold Stores, Squires and Kintons, Tesco, Beaumont Lays, Melton Pedigree Pet Foods, North West Leicestershire United Biscuits Ashby, Odeby and Wigston Woolco, Rutland G. Ruddle and Co. The release of food stocks would be a decision for the regional commissioner in consultation with the MAFF liaison officer. Control and distribution would have then become a county controller matter in consultation with the county food officer. Once distribution to emergency feeding centers was possible the need to guard such stocks would be self-obvious. A heavy burden for this would be placed upon the police or it was anticipated surviving armed forces would assist. It was estimated that staffing of feeding centers would be organized into 8-hour shifts with 12 staff on each shift feeding approximately 1,000 people. Interestingly, one of the feeding center jobs would be washing up with what? I wonder.
It would be the aim to deliver a meal providing around 1,200 calories per day. This would be controlled by the issue of ration books distributed from district council offices in the build-up to war period. However, let us be realistic for a moment. When a county controller has to make the decision over issue of food with limited supplies I would not be surprised to find that 1,200 calories would be for those able to perform manual labor. I would consider this figure to be lower for those who could not. In post-attack Leicestershire I don't think it would be possible to carry anyone. Normal pre-attack considerations and help for those less able would go out of the window in the grim aftermath. As money would have lost its meaning, food would undoubtedly become the new currency. To ensure that the surviving population contributed to the rebuilding process, food could be given or withheld dependent upon contribution, withheld as punishment even. It would also be a grim fact to realize that the more people who died would mean the more food for everyone else. It is uncertain for how long these emergency feeding arrangements would have been relied upon. With no imports of food likely ultimately the long-term survival prospects would have been dependent upon restarting agriculture. MAFF would have been responsible to the Regional Commissioner for the control of agriculture, including the supply of food from farms. Groups of about 800 agricultural holdings would be controlled by local agricultural control officer LACO from MAFF's divisional office, Chalfant Drive, Nottingham. Farm wardens would have provided a link between agriculture offices and small groups of farms. LACOs would be located at or near local authority wartime HQs to facilitate liaison with district food offices. MAFF's veterinary service would give specialist advice on the post-attack condition of livestock, 